All right, hello everyone. This is Howie again. Welcome back to week 11 of Web Design Decal. This week, I'm going to be teaching you about loops, arrays, and libraries. Um, so this is actually going to be our uh, second to last lecture of this course, which is crazy to think about because um, we're almost done. So yeah, hopefully you guys are staying safe as always. You know, um, as we're nearing the end of semester, towards like finals, um, if you guys have finals in the first place. Um, it can become a really stressful time as you're, as you're like finishing up a lot of projects and homeworks for classes and then trying to study for those classes too. So definitely prioritize uh, your, your mental health first before um, doing work or anything like that. So keep that in mind. Um, if you have anything that you want to bring up to us as staff, that something we can help you with, uh, definitely do. We'll try to accommodate for that. So, um, but hopefully you guys are, I don't, I don't know, just do like a lot of self-care stuff um, and things that you enjoy. So yeah, let's just get right into it. First things first is announcements. Uh, homework 10 is released tonight and this is your last homework. Woo, yay. No more homeworks after this. But um, definitely do this homework. Um, it's super fun. This was like my favorite homework doing uh, when I took this class. You'll get use you'll use JavaScript and you get to dress Drake the artist, and you'll know what um I'll talk what I'm talking about when you guys look at the spec. So yeah, please do that homework. It's really fun. Final project wise, uh, everything's still the same. It's due next Tuesday, which is in a week. Um, so definitely keep doing what you're doing. If you haven't started, please start because it it's a lot of work actually. Um, so yeah. We really loved seeing all you guys' checkoffs. Uh, for those of you that came to our office hours, those were like super cool and you guys had really uh, unique ideas and we definitely love to see what it's like the final product would look like um, at the end. So keep trying your best. Uh, as always, if you have any questions or issues about implementing something on your final project, we have office hours or you can just email us um, whenever So or post on Piazza. So yeah. Uh, one thing I want to point out that a uh, reminder that the submission for final project is over uh, on this Google form and not through the portal um, because part of this uh, project is we want to we want you to host your website on GitHub pages, which is like a free online web hosting uh, app or source. So basically what you, what it means, like you'll get your own unique URL that anyone can search up on the web or can access. And that's how you'll get your own website, basically. And you'll be submitting that link through this Google form again. If you submit on the portal, we're not going to uh, look at it. We're not going to consider it because like we're not going to look at the portal in the first place. Um, so please submit on the form or else you might uh, be might get like a zero on this project, which we definitely don't want you to get so yeah as usual we have our office hours listed here and the feedback form if you if you have anything to say about how we're teaching or anything in this course so yep so before we dive into this week's material uh we have a couple uh resources that we want to introduce for you guys so the first thing is a website called cofolios um so basically what this website is if you go to this website it'll take you here this website is like a compilation of all like interns at big companies and their like uh, their roles and their personal websites. So you they have like blogs for like how did they get like a job here, like landing a UX design internship at Google, stuff like that. So um, it's important to note that all most of these positions are like design related. So like uh, product design, UI, UX, stuff like that. So you could like click on any of these tabs, let's say like Apple. And it shows like a list of people who've uploaded uh, like Apple interns that have uploaded their personal websites and stuff like that. And you can click on them and uh, visit their websites. Uh, if you go to Adobe, you can see uh, UC Berkeley, uh, Gemma. She was actually an instructor for web design for a while and she taught when I was taking this class. So um, if you look, it'll take uh, you to her website. But I don't think this is the updated one. There's definitely a newer one, I think. But yeah, she was a previous instructor and she's super good at like designing and stuff like that. Um, she was one of the people or she was, she contributed to the redesign of uh, Berkeley Time actually. So she has a lot of knowledge and she's very wise and she's done a lot of 
cool design internships. Um, yeah. Another resource on this page is like office hours. If you go here, like these people like volunteer. Oh, you can see like Gemma, you know, she also has office hours. So they volunteer their own time for anyone to uh, like a book a time with them. And you could like ask them anything about like design stuff, like whatever questions you have in mind. Uh, I don't know if Gemma's still doing it, but if it's still listed, you could definitely try to book a time with her. Um, she's really chill and she's a really smart person. So she has a lot of wisdom to Im impart on you. Yeah. Um, so besides that, you can re uh, register with like anyone. They're like all from different colleges throughout the country or the nation, uh, the globe. And they all have like really good knowledge to, uh, to, or advice to give to you if you have any questions based on this, uh, this topic. So yeah, this is definitely a good resource to use for finding inspiration or asking questions, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So the next thing would be, let's, the next resource we have for you, I'm not going to go to the website, but it's called Students Who Design. So the URL is just studentswho.design. Um, and the link is in the speaker notes at the bottom. And um, this is just like a three-week uh, product design course. Uh, and you can read more information about it um, on their website. It's just... They teach you a lot of like really detailed uh, design concepts in depth. So if you're interested about learning more about design, you could definitely try to apply for this uh, three-week course and learn more. And apparently like a lot of people who've taken this have gone on to do a lot of design-related internships and jobs at big companies. So yeah, this is a good resource to consider if you want to learn more about design. So, yeah, that's those are the two resources we wanted to mention. Uh, definitely use them when you can. And, yeah, let's just do a quick review of last week's stuff. So, last week I talked about event handlers and conditionals. Um, I'm just going to breeze through this section because uh, I'm assuming that you have already watched last week's lecture or have like are confident in this topic. Um, but, yeah. First thing, like you've probably seen this line so many times now, let food equals doc, document dot get element by ID food list. And hopefully by now you know what get element by ID means. Um, it just looks through our HTML DOM and it tries to find an HTML tag with the ID called food dash list. And it assigns that object to our variable food. That's basically what this line is doing. And speaking of DOM, uh, the DOM is again just a Java, a thing that JavaScript creates on its own when the HTML page is loaded, um, and it's made of all these objects based off of your HTML file. So um, this is the general structure structure of how it looks like, and each of these uh, objects have their own properties that you can use, uh, which you probably already have used through the previous homeworks and stuff like that. Um, what the line doc get element by ID is doing is like it wants us to look at the HTML DOM that it uh, it created when it loaded the website, and it will traverse down this street, uh, this tree or the structure, until we find an element, uh, an HTML element with the ID food dash list. So we'll start at document at the top, and then go down its body, and then look, keep looking until we find food list, and then apply that wherever we're using this line. So, yep. And every DOM element has an on-click function or on mouse over on key press. Uh, if you did last week's homework, you definitely know what we're talking about here. Um, but yeah, these are all built-in functions in JavaScript that you can just call without like pre, without you needing to define what it means. So in this case, we have like, uh, when we click on button dot element, oops, dot element, uh, button element, it will run show greeting function. And in this case, it will alert us saying howdy. Um, we could also change CSS through JavaScript directly. Um, and that's through the style dot whatever property that you want to do. So in this case, uh, when we click on a button, the button element, we run this function, which runs change color red. And in that we say element dot style dot background color becomes color. And this will be the specific, uh, property, CSS property that you we can change. Um, and this can 
be applied for any CSS property. Let's say like you want to change to display. Uh, you would do element.style.display equals a string like none or like block, inline, inline block, or something like that. Um, but it's important to note that whatever we ass assign <coughs> to this style.background color or style that whatever, it always has to be in a string format. So in this case, when we're changing background color, the color has to be in quotes, which is a string. Um, that's how CSS reads the text and that's how the, it applies the changes to CSS um, in the websites. Other than like, if you don't do a string and you forget the quotes, it's just gonna, it's not gonna run and it might even break your whole website. So uh, keep in mind that when we change style dot whatever, it has to be in a string format. Uh, there's also the difference between using an anonymous function and like having a function with a name. Um, in this case, we only use an anonymous function because like uh, we can write however much code we want in here and that will only be applied for this specific element, only when we click on button element and not to anything else on the page. Um, yeah. So the first topic we're going to talk about today is arrays. And what an array is, is like in JavaScript, an array is a list of values, and we use them to represent multiple objects in one placeholder. So, so far, what you guys have been doing in this class, we've taught you like how to declare a variable, but we've only been assigning like one thing at a time to each variable. So like, let's say like let var equals one, let var equals two, um, or let var equals like string, a string or something like that. But these are just like one items, one item per variable name. Um, but here we can assign multiple things in one uh, variable. So how do you do that? It looks something like this. Um, so this is the basic JavaScript syntax of how to declare an array. Um, let's just break it down step by step. So the first thing is the left side. Um, it looks the same thing as when you declare a variable, right? Uh, you guys have seen this through all the homeworks and all these lectures. Let whatever variable name you want to name it equals. And that's the same thing uh, when we declare an array. So that should be pretty self-explanatory uh, and simple to get. But now on our right-hand side, that's like the different part. Like how do we, this is how we uh, define an array. And this is done by using square brackets. So when we start a list, we use an open square bracket. And when we end the list, we use a closing square bracket. And inside of this list would be whatever items that we have. Um, and notice how every item in the list is separated by a comma. And this is how the console will know like, oh, like uh, protein is different from caffeine and caffeine is different from bananas. If you don't have these commas, this will be all one thing. And there's only technically one item in the list. Um, with commas, they'll know, it'll know like, oh, there's like three things in this list. Um, that's how it's separated. So protein, the string is our first item of the list. Uh, caffeine is the second item of the list. And bananas is the third item of the list. And notice how like, um, because bananas is our last item with this closing bracket, we don't need to use a comma afterwards. It's just closing bracket. And that's how we signal that there's no more items afterwards. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, there's a built-in JavaScript attribute for all arrays that returns the length of the array. And that's done with dot length. Um, so like, let's say we use the same definition of this array. We have three items in here. Um, so you just do cart or whatever variable name is your array and you do dot length af after that. And that will just automatically look into your array and then return the number total number of items in that list. So in this case, when we console.log cart.length, it would just print out three to the console. Um, and again, it's important to note that it's built in so you don't have to like, uh, write your, a function by yourself that like tries to find the length of the array. This is already given to you. So you just call dot length after the variable name. <clears throat> um, so now you're probably wondering like, what if I just want to access one of these items in the list, like, and not affect anything else, you know? Um, I just want to get one of the items at a time. And you could definitely do that. Um, in CS, we call this array indexing. And all these programming languages use this same concept throughout. Um, and we use this through something called zero index arrays. So normally when we speak like in English or like just any language, uh, when we say like first, second, third, or one, two, three, it's like one, two, three, right? We start at one, that's the first item. However, in like CS, in any programming language, um, 
there's zero index, which means the first item of the list will always start at zero. And don't ask me like how it, it came to be like this. I guess like the people who created like CS concepts wanted to be cool and be unique in a way. I don't know. I thought it was pretty complicated at first, but your first item is always going to be at zero and not one. So one will be the second item. It's, it'll be kind of confusing at first or like hard to like adjust, but you'll get the hang of it after a little bit. So what it looks like when we index is by using the square brackets and then the number in between. So it looks something like this. So we have our normal array uh, cart with these uh, fruits in it. And to get the first element, we just do cart uh, square bracket zero. And that's the square bracket symbolizes array indexing. So it means get the first element of cart the zeroth element of cart, which is apples, and that will print out apples. Uh, for cart square brackets one, it will print out oranges because of the second element of the list, and cart square brackets two is bananas, it will print out bananas, because that's the last item of the list. Um, if you're wondering, like, what if we put like cart three, and we don't have like a fourth item on the list, it would just uh, error. It would say like, index out of range or something like that, It would, and then that line would error and then break the rest of the code. So definitely be careful how you index, because if you do an index out of range error, it would break things. Um, you also can do like negative numbers. So like let's say cart square brackets negative one. That means like the last item, get the last item. And the negative two is like the second to last and then so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so you can definitely do negative numbers. So where are arrays useful? Like why do we use these? So basically, so far, you guys been using get element ID by ID, which just gets one thing at a time, right? Because IDs are unique on an HTML page, and there should only be one ID, unique ID, on each HTML file. That's why get element by ID would just return one element at a time. But you know that there's also classes, right? Like you've used classes so many times, and this is like styles that are shared across multiple elements. So, and there's a way we can get multiple classes. Um, and that's been, that's done through get elements by class name. So here's another function that you can use to just get by class name and not ID. Uh, you might have seen this and played around with this. You might not, don't worry. We'll walk through how it works and stuff like that. And it definitely ties in with arrays because um, like, you know, classes, multiple elements or multiple HTML tags can have the same class name. And when we do get elements by class name, um, this would return a list or an array of elements that have that name, that same class name. So like in this case, where we're trying to find uh, class name food items, we're getting all the HTML tags with the class food item in it. And then it returns it in a list format, just how I taught you a couple slides ago. So definitely keep in mind like, uh, elements is plural in this case. There's a lot of, I've come to notice, like, especially with last semester, a lot of people got confused. They're like, why is my get elements by class name function not working, blah, blah, blah. And there's a distinction, a very small distinction, which is kind of stupid in my uh, opinion when they made JavaScript. Like, elements is plural in when you get class name, but it's not when it's ID. I mean, I guess it makes sense, but like, it's such a small distinction that like, Without the S, it would break the class name function. Um, so definitely keep in mind that it's get elements, plural, by class name. And then for IDs, it's get element, singular, uh, by ID. So yeah, just like this. So right now, if we do document.getElementById food list, what this does is like it will assign uh, the whole UL unordered list tag, oops, unordered list tag to our food variable. But that's just one thing, right? Like what if I just wanna, uh, I wanna get all these items inside food list because I wanna make direct edits to each item. And that's done with uh, get elements by class name, food item. So like you notice how like three things ha share the same class, food item. And um, that's how get elements by class name will try to look for these classes. And they'll, it will assign these items in a list format and that will look like something like this. So food equals, uh, opening square brackets, so that's the beginning of the list, and then the first item is this uh, list item, li tag of apples, 
The second is the LI tag of bananas. Third is LI tag of oranges and then closing bracket. Um, that's like the end of our list because um, there's only three items in this case with class name food item. So this is what food will kind of look like after using document.get elements by class name. Um, so yeah. So at the beginning of the, towards the beginning of the semester when we started CSS, uh, I taught you guys like all about IDs and classes and when to use them. So now it's like, I give you the same picture of Airbnb. I asked you like what might use classes and what might use IDs. Uh, definitely like you probably would know, have a better idea of like what will use what in this picture after a lot of practicing. And I'll leave that for you to like try to figure out like what uses classes, what uses IDs in this case. So yeah, just to refresh your memories of how classes and IDs work. Um, yeah, so you're wondering like, okay, like I got all my class names, you know, like now it's in a list. So what, like, I, do I have to like individually like index through each item to like make changes to it, make the same change and write like, like unnecessary redundant lines of code for every single item in the list. What if there's like a hundred items? Like, holy, that would be, that'd be crazy. I don't want to write that much. But now there's something called loopy loops. We do loops in code. Whoa, you, like what kind of loops you might ask? Like first one, while loops. There's while loops um, in code throughout all the programming languages. There's do while loops. There's uh, for each loops. But in this class, we're gonna talk about for loops. Um, don't worry about the rest, the other three that I previously mentioned. Once you understand for loops, it's pretty easy to understand the other three. So, yeah. And you're probably like, you know, like, I mean, I guess like Fruit Loops is also some sort of loops, although I do prefer other cereal than Fruit Loops. It's all right. But, heh, yeah. For loops, Fruit Loops, eh, same thing. <laughs> um, basically, a for loop allows you to repeat some code until a certain condition is met. Ooh, condition, you know. Uh, reminder from last lecture, we learned about if statements and their conditions, stuff like that. So this is going to use it too. Um, or for a certain number of times. So what that basically looks like um, is something like this. What is a for loop? So in English, what this is like, it does a thing that you define for um, for a certain number of times without you having to write it out every single iteration. So if you take a look at this right hand side, this for loop code, it looks like this. Um, and the reason why we use for loop code, yeah, it's more cleaner and more uh, maintainable. Like you're not going to write console.log like 10 times, you know. Um, so let's just break down the uh, this for loop step by step. So the first part of the for loop is, um, well, before we even talk about the start, it's just like for, and then inside the, the parentheses is the condition. So this is the start. Um, we create a variable named I. Um, in our case, we could say it stands for index. You can name it whatever, let I, let D, let variable, let index, whatever. It's whatever you want it to be named. Um, and in our case, we set it to zero. And that's where our variable I will start off with. It will start equaling zero. The second one is the end for when the for loop should end. That's the condition it will always look at. Um, so what this means is keep doing the actions inside the for loop, this console.log, um, while I is less than 10. So you can imagine like while I, when it's zero, it would run stuff inside. Um, but when it's not like, when it's like 10 or greater, then it will stop running whatever is inside of the for loop. Um, the third part of the for loop is this part called repeat where we say I plus plus. Um, what this plus plus means is just increment I by one every time we loop, every time it, uh, we execute the for loop once. So um, it's also written as I plus equals one. It's the same thing. I plus plus, I plus equals one is the uh, same exact syntax. Works the same. Um, but this means like uh, whenever we run this for loop, let's say like when we start off at zero, we do this because zero is less than 10. We'll run console.log counting to um, nine would print out like counting to nine zero and then after we run this line it would make a loop right it'll come back but then when we come back it would increment the i by one 
Um, so now i becomes 1. And i is still less than, or 1 is still less than 10, so it still run everything here. So it's like counting to 9, 1. And you can imagine it would go on and forever until we reach 9. And then after we say counting to 9, 9, we add another 1, it becomes 10. But 10 is less than, 10 is not less than 10, so we finish this for loop. We don't run it again. So this is what it looks like, yeah. Um, in this case, we started at 1. For simplicity purposes, uh, you can start at any number um, as long as the condition is met. So, like I said, we start off at 1, it will print out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, um, because it's a loop and a loop for that many times. But once we reach, like, once we finish 9 and we come back into this loop, it adds 1 to 9, which becomes 10, and 10 is not less than 10, so it doesn't print out counting to 9, 10. Um, at that point, we've already finished this for loop and then we'll continue running whatever code is underneath the for loop. So that's what the output of a for loop would look like. So what would this print, you know, like, or actually before I even mention that, like, um, now we can like use this to index uh, into lists, you know, like, I'll, and I'll go into an example in a bit. Um, that's the whole purpose of like using loops. Um, especially when like your lists are like are like big, they have like a lot of items in it. You can use a for loop to iterate through every single one of them, and I'll show you how it is. So before that, we'll just like uh, go through this little quick example of like, oh, what will this print? Um, so we have for loop let i equals zero. I will start off as zero. Um, we have a condition here saying i is less than ten, and then we'll increment i by one every single time. So what would console.log i print every single time? So you could think like on the first iteration, our i is 0, uh, we print console.log 0. So the first thing would be 0. Um, then uh, we repeat this loop. We add 1 to 0. So 1 is less than 10 still. So we print, print 1. And it goes on forever. So we say 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And we don't print out 10 because 10 is not less than 10. So it's very similar to the last example we went through. So again, the output of this is zero through nine. So yeah. So now what if like the only change we made is we made i less than or equal to 10. So this is very similar. The beginning is uh, the same thing as the last problem. It would print out zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But this time it would also print 10 because when we run the loop and we i becomes 10, uh, 10 is less than or equal to 10. So yeah, that's satisfied. So we print out 10 in this case. So it'd be 0 through 10. And then once we come back into the loop again, it would add 1 to 10, which becomes 11. 11 is not less than or equal to 10. So that's where we know like, okay, don't don't run this anymore. We finish the for loop. Um, so the output again of this would be 0 through 10. So here I was talking about like, uh, this is where we can index into lists, you know? Uh, so let's say we have our cart again, and it's like protein, caffeine, bananas. Um, and here we can like say, uh, do our for loop, let i start at zero, and i should be less than cart.length. And cart.length in this case is, is three. So i is technically less than three. And then we increment i by one every single uh, iteration. So in this case, what would this, uh, this for loop print out? So we do every iteration, we print out console.log cart index at i. So you can imagine our first iteration, when we set i as 0, we go in here. 0 is less than 3 in the first place, so we can run the stuff inside. Um, so that means cart, we do console.log cart of indexing of 0, uh, because i equals 0. That would print out protein. The first thing we print out is protein. Um, then we finished it, so we go back into the loop. Uh, start over again, and i would now equal 1 in this case because we added 1 on the second uh, iteration. Um, and 1 is still less than cart.length, which is 3. So 1 is less than 3. And now we do console.log cart index of 1, and that's caffeine. Um, so I print out caffeine the second time. Then we go back, uh, i becomes 2 now, uh, 2 is still less than 3. Uh, and so we do cart, we print out cart index 2. Um, and that's banana. So you can imagine we print out protein, caffeine, then bananas and in that order. Um, and then we come back into the loop to we add one to two, three is not less than three. So we just end the for loop there. So we just printed out every single item in 
this list. Uh, that's the output of this for loop. And so again, using cart.length, that's uh, the dot length function is very useful, especially when you do loops, uh, for loops. So it knows like how many items are in this, um, how many items are in this array without you like getting an error of index out of range, stuff like that. So um, you'll definitely uh, use this kind of concept on your homework this week. So definitely refer back to this slide. It's pretty useful. Oh, so now we're just going to switch gears into a completely different topic. Hopefully you guys uh, understood uh, arrays and for loops, stuff like that. So that's definitely going to be applied into your homework. As always, if you have questions or I didn't do a good job explaining it, please let me know um, through feedback and Piazza posts. So yeah, so this is more geared towards like, I don't know, just like web design in general. Um, especially it's probably more relevant to your final projects. So these are JavaScript libraries. We're going to talk about these. Um, so JavaScript, like HTML or CSS, it, we have a set of syntax rules. It's like um, how we write code that makes sense to the console. Um, and it defines a logical and executable environment. So when like the console looks through our JavaScript code, it has to match a certain syntax for it to not error. Um, and I'm sure you guys already know what happens when it errors. Um, however, we have what we call libraries that are built on top of a language and it acts as a tool so that we can just use it right out of the box. So um, libraries are kind of like open source uh, like code that people have created um, by themselves and like put it online for everyone to use. So a good analogy that we like to make in this class is like, um, let's say in a utopian world where you actually can go outside without getting caught by the police now, you know, like we don't have a virus pandemic to worry about. Um, you want to make like pasta for dinner, but like you're not going to, I'm sure a lot of you guys aren't even going to like consider making the dough from scratch, right? There's a lot of pastas at like Walmart, Target, all these shops that like they have them pre-made for you. And all you got to do is just boil it. Um, so you can imagine libraries, JavaScript libraries, kind of like these pre-made pastas. Um, because they're already made for you, like why go, why bother with like making more um, just like pasta dough from scratch, wasting more time than like just buying it from the store and just cooking it like that. I mean, like if you want to make the dough, sure, go ahead. But like the idea is like it's already pre-made for you. So just use it. And the same concept goes for JavaScript libraries. They're already made for you. So you can just like import their code um, in like one or two simple lines and boom, it'll work on your website. So I'm just going to list a lot of different types of libraries there are out there. Of course, this is not like the whole list. There's like like hundreds of thousands of JavaScript libraries in the world. Um, I'm just going to go through like really cool and common ones. So first of which is like particles.js. Um, yeah, like if I'll, I'll just go to the website, honestly. If you go to particles.js, um, they give like a cool demo of how it looks like. So it looks like this. Whoa, like this stuff is moving around. And when you move your cursor, it's like interactive, you know? Wow, like this is crazy to think this is already like a built in or not built in it's a library that you can just import with like a couple lines of codes and it'll work like this like imagine coding this in javascript from scratch like that's insane um but yeah this is like you have download buttons so if you want to download it or you can go to their github to see like how you can install it and like how it works and stuff like that um, and you can again it's open source so you can see all that code uh another example is waypoints. Um, I guess I just won't go into like opening every single one. Waypoints is like a library that like sh has an interactiveness when you scroll. So like uh, a lot of you guys in your final projects talked about like having everything on a single page and like when you scroll it's like parallax scrolling or like this button will lead it to a certain spot. Um, there's like I said to a lot of you guys there's this JavaScript uh, library for this and that's what waypoints does. Um, there's Quill, which l allows you to, I think it just basically embeds a text editor in your website. So like you can, if you use like Atom or Sublime, you could use like something similar in a website. So 
that's another library you can import. There's confetti, you know, like, um, I don't know if they do this anymore, but like when you get into, you guys got into Berkeley, like, and you, when you read the uh, acceptance letter, it, confetti was probably falling from the screen, right? And this was probably the library that you, they used. You could just recreate your Berkeley letter of acceptance, you know, to feel a sense of gratification again. Honestly, I should do this. Um, but yeah, this is like uh, a confetti library that like has like a lot of different like particles falling down <laughs> on your screen. And you could change it into like snowflakes. I've seen a lot of people change it to different things. Um, like dog faces, stuff like that. And yeah. Um, Plier is a JavaScript library that allows you to embed like uh, videos onto your website. So like what, if you want to play a YouTube video on your site, you can import this library and it will uh, have a cool video player um, on that website. There are Snap SVGs. This uh, library makes cool like interactive uh, SVGs whenever like it's kind of like an event handler like oh like let's say I hover over this part and then this SVG will change um, and have a cool animation. So it's like interactive S SVGs and this is a cool library that does this. Um, yeah. There's 3.js which um, basically it allows you to import 3D objects and 3D models. Um, here's a good example of code drops, the aviator. I think it's like a game um, where you can like play, fly a plane or something like that. Um, but yeah, you can import 3.js for 3D models if you want to make cool 3D things. There's matter.js, um, which basically imports physics. Um, there's like gravity or something like that and like how gravity works and it'll be replicated on a website. So you can see like you could probably see or imagine how like these would like swing back and forth or this ball would fall down. Um, just how normal gravity would work. Um, so that's matter.js. Anime.js, um, I'm not quite sure about this one. I think it just makes cool animations. That's that's it. Um, you could definitely look at this yourself when you have the time, but um, this is a pretty common one where you want to make cool animations. So this is something you definitely want to consider. There's jump.js. Ooh, these ones I'm not quite sure about. Um, oh, this is just smooth scrolling library. Another like uh, scrolling library. So this is... For a lot of you guys, would you probably want to use this for your final projects, especially when your things are on the same page. Um, and last but not least, there's type it. Um, a lot of you guys also mentioned you want to like have a typewriter effect that types out uh, this animation that types out words on your website, and this is what does it. And I'll actually do a demo on this right now. So uh, yeah, let's just let's just go into type it. So when we go to their website, it's like this home page. They're like, oh my gosh, like, look at this, all this code. This is so daunting. Where do I begin, you know? Uh, yeah, so, like, I just have, like, a boring index.html page. Uh, and then I have a script, uh, JavaScript page. And I've already linked that JavaScript page here. Um, but I don't have anything here yet because I want to save that for the typewriter effect. Uh, type it. So how do we import it in the first place? Let's see. Like, um, they have a tab called installation. And look, like, load on page. They just tell you, like, just copy this script. And they just, they just give you the whole line. I'm just going to copy it uh, and then put it here. You know, like, scripts go at the bottom of the page because you want everything to load first. And then, boom, that's just you've imported it. That's it. Um, and then number two is just, like, configure and go. So let's see. They, they have, like, a ton of examples. Um, you can see here, like, uh, this is type of simple string uh, or, like, type multiple strings. It shows cool examples of how you do it, and they just show code. Like, here, like, I'm just going to copy this p tag with the ID simple usage, and then they have JavaScript here. I'm just going to copy this JavaScript. Boom. Like, uh, the string is this. In this case, speed is 50. Uh, wait until visible is true. These are all preset stuff that they have defined in this library. So uh, Because we have nothing on this page you can imagine like when we load it, there's nothing but Now that we have the typewriter effects what that does you can see oh Whoa, like it just printed it out Like it typed it. That's so cool. You know, and it even has that little cursor typer cursor thingy that just flashes in and out 
So, I mean, it's not going to look the best because you can definitely add CSS to this and stuff like that. But that's just the basic gist of how you use like this library. Um, let's say I don't want this string. I'm just going to change the string like how he is so cool. Yay. <laughs> um, and it will change. Howie is so cool. Wow. Great. You know, like I just need to change this thing and it will change on the website. All I needed was this one P tag, you know. Um, I could change his name, let's say Howie. Um, then we'd have to reflect it here because we ha it has to know what we're selecting. Change it to Howie. Should change. Yeah. Um, same thing. So that's an example of how you can import this one specific uh, library. Um, I do want to mention that like all these different libraries have their own like way of importing and using it because again it's open source and it's made by a ton of different people so it honestly it really depended on like the coding habits and like preferences of these people who made it so you it might not be the same procedure uh for a different library compared to like this type it library um but overall it should be very similar some may require you to download files and then link it some like the one i just went over just automatically allows you to like uh, it gives you a link, a script link that imports it from the web. Um, so definitely make sure you read through like the installation guidelines and procedures to see how all these libraries are used. And as always, if you have like questions of how to import these um, and you don't know, you can ask any of us at uh, any time. So yeah, that was just how you can use uh, this type it library. Pretty cool. Um, and it's really simple. So yeah, you can imagine like this code, like trying to write this code in JavaScript from scratch. That would take like hundreds of lines. So, and all I did was put like five lines total and it worked. So, libraries, so powerful. Um, definitely use this for your final project. Besides that, that's about it. Um, here's your atten attendance word, yinim, enim. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, my last lecture that I'll be giving. So, hopefully, you guys enjoyed me lecturing you guys really sorry how it like turned out this way this semester definitely didn't plan on that but um uh thank you guys for just being in this class and hopefully you guys learned a lot from uh us instructors tas and me teaching um and yeah again i hope to see you guys as really cool final projects in the end so yeah see you guys um if you have any questions or you want to reach out to me even after like this semester ends or next semester like definitely do um i'm like available add me on facebook or like whatever linkedin and we can chat so yeah thank you for tuning in and hopefully you guys enjoy